talking to somebody about it, and I was excited because I can go, you know, I can talk to Democrats and MPAs too. More votes, and he said, "Oh, that's a bad thing. You need somebody in there to close that primary." And hired police lieutenant in a family of law enforcement. My husband's a retired captain from the city of Ocala. Two of our three sons are current sergeants. One's with Ocala PD. One's with Sumter County Sheriff's Office. Our oldest son, I have to throw him in because he gets ex he gets excluded in the law enforcement chatter, but he's a road construction supervisor. And I share my husband's daughter. She's a uh, nurse. A corrections nurse in Buffalo, New York. And we have 12 and a half grandkids. <laughs> one, on the, one on the way, <laughs> 12 and a half, <laughs> yes. But we've been, um, we just had our 43rd anniversary. We've been in the uh, Marion County for about 50 years. He did drag me to California for three years and I dragged him back. It took three years to convince him that it wasn't a good place to raise kids. So I am, like I said, I'm a retired, retired police lieutenant. I have a very strong business background. I um, had owned a country store. I can't say that country store with my daughter-in-law. Um, she has MS, and that just made it worse. We left on a high note. We were very successful. It went nationwide. We had people coming from all over the country to our store. Started online sales, but it was just making her MS worse and worse. So we gifted it to a friend who destroyed it with my Anyway, yeah. Anyway, so um, since the 2020 election was stolen, well, it first started with my brother-in-law being one of the first people that we knew um, got COVID, ended up in ICU. My sister couldn't be with him. They were high school sweethearts, but married over 40 years. He was in ICU for 30 days. So she saw him in the ambulance and then she saw him at the funeral home. Aww. They refused to let her go there we found out later that they had given him remdesivir oh. and that um, shut down all his organs and he died from that. Wow. And we also found out, so he got sick in July of 2020. We found out later in June of 2020, every member of Congress was allowed to have HCQ and ivermectin. So that started me digging mm. what was going on because I was a normal person before then, you know, complained about the government, but I was a super voter. So I was doing everything. I was, I was patriotic and, um, when, it, when we watched the 2020 election being stolen, I watched every single, oh, by the way, how many, how much time do I have? Because I'll fast forward. Well, we're here until one o'clock. Yeah, we're here okay. until one, so <laughs> hey. So, Talk as much as you want. I watched every Senate hearing, every single one, remember after the 2020 uh -huh. election, shortly, um, like 2021, and um, watched the, the, the um, January 6th, and saw all the videos from actual people on the ground, not the, not the deep state, and I had to find my, my people. So I found the uh, Marion County Republican Executive Committee. I had never gone there. I thought it was a bunch of people sitting around um, drinking beers and complaining about Fox News, and I didn't want to be part of that. But when I walked in the door and found my people, it was a packed full of patriots, and it still is. And I had taken my sister-in-law because of um, my my mom backtracking a little bit my mom lived with us for the last four years of her life and her dementia had gotten worse so my husband thankfully he could stay home with her and i could go to the meetings so just one of us went but anyway so i'm digressing i that evolved into me finding defend florida um i did knocking on doors canvassing saw where our voter rolls in marion county were not right at all you had a list of 15 people in one house and two people lived there, and none of those those two people were on the list. And our supervisor of election at the time, or now, um, at the time, he got upset with us for bringing not to his attention or to the public's attention. And he went on CNN even to um, tell everybody that we were spreading misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation, mm -hmm. and DM, what is it, whatever it is. So I progressed through the Defend Florida they created a tracing unit to gather and um, to try to trace all the people that we couldn't find that were on our voter rolls. And this was statewide, and there were hundreds of people working on this. When tracers couldn't find them, it went up to the new team, which I was the head of because I was law enforcement background. We were the resolution team. And because I understood the law, I understood the election laws, how they were supposed to be applied, and I understood public records laws, we generated um, public records request to every 
one of the 67 counties. We started getting back, 45% um, of the 67 counties gave us the same cut and paste mm -hmm. excuse. Um, we have no records responsive to your request and furthermore, they're exempt due to trade secrets and cybersecurity. That was wrong. The um, information we, asking, we were asking for was not exempt. We also were ignored or we were receiving quotes for records tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, our highest quote was half a million dollars for records. So we thought, well, okay, some of them are confused. They think that we want these thousands of records printed off copies. So we revised our request and we said, no, we want digital format, the statute says in a format such as ASCII, same thing. We could not get the records. And um, so for, we wasted a year on that. Um, I can tell you right now that after all this time that we have never been able to verify that Florida's elections are actually the gold standard. So we worked with Defend Florida. My small core team soon moved away from them. We wanted to focus on voter roll maintenance because that the voter rolls in Florida are dirty. Yep. And that's the whole, they're subject to fraud. Mm -hmm. Dirty voter rolls equal fraud. Right. Equals fraud. And um, we concentrate on that. And we also, part of uh, what we do, we formed a PAC called, and an organization called Local AF. Now the AF stands for America First, okay? So there's, um, of course, you know what the other AF is. That's not us. So just a full disclaimer or disclosure, I'm not represented by the PAC because I've been working with these people for years. They're my support system and I want their support more than I need a PAC support. I, if I was represented by the PAC, I couldn't work with them. And that was a, that was a quick decision to make. But so there's one half of the um, argument that says he lost all his effectiveness. If you're not in the committees and you're not able to write bills and everybody's ignoring you, what good are you? You know, how can you work for the people? And then there's the other, you know, what do you do? You have to change the top culture. <laughs> and uh, and I, I would say thank you, Becky, um, that um, we do have to have people that are activists in in so many areas, and we've got to secure our elections like never before. So I'm 100% in line with that. So thank you for the work you've done so far to, to uh, make it happen and get people aware of what's going on. Um, so to give you a little bit of, of who Steve Shives is, because um, up until a couple of years ago, I didn't want to have anything to do with politics. I voted, registered to vote when I was 18, and you know, and I've always voted and been involved, but but not um, not to the extent that the last several years have gotten so many people on board and aware with you know we've got to do something. This, it is it is time for us to wake up mm -hmm. and not be woke, but be um, awakened and uh, and do something. And uh, and so I, I've just this is a whole new thing to me. I, in fact, I said I'd never be involved in politics. Didn't want to have a, pro, a, a play in it. Just uh, wanted to do what I did. And and so what I've done is I've always been in business for myself. Uh, one of the one of the reasons I think I was approached about running for this office last year, and and I said no, I think you got the wrong guy. But uh, um, but the response I got was no, you need to think about this because we believe we got the right guy. We don't need another lawyer. We don't need another lobbyist. We don't need a you know another person with a political science degree in Tallahassee. We need people with boots on the ground that have been there and know the struggles. That, that everyday people have, and and so uh, I was been in Marion County since the 70s. And my family moved here from Baltimore in '72. We um, we've always been active in the community. My wife and I moved away for about 11 years to South Carolina, where I pastored, planted, and pastored the church. So by vocationally, I I've, I've pastored in addition to running my own businesses, and. Um, and so, 1980, I was 14 years old, I was, I, I thought everybody grew up this way. I found out, you know, that not every kid grew up with a lot of the opportunities that I had. Um, some of them that did didn't take advantage of them. But um, 
1980, my dad was in the auction business and he bought and sold a little bit of everything on the north side of Ocala and Mar uh, Florida Peach went out of business. He ended up buying an old semi truck that was parked in the, in the peach groves and had been sitting there for years. He bought the, bought the rig because it was loaded down with, with cardboard cartons that he could resell and, uh, and thought, man, I can make enough off the cardboard boxes to pay for the whole thing. He paid $300, tractor, trailer, full of cardboard boxes. And, uh, and so towed the whole thing back to our property and, and it sat there. And I came home from school every day and I worked on that old semi truck until I got it running. And, uh, and I started learning to drive a semi truck in a horse pasture on the north side of Ocala. I'd come home after I, got, I would come home in the afternoons and I would back a semi trailer in circles in a five acre <laughs> field just, just to see if I could. And, uh, and so I've always had a passion for business and for being my own boss, uh, you know, and pursuing what people call the American dream. Two years later, at 16 years old, I took my GED and I started a trucking business. Wow. And I've been working 80 hours a week ever since. But uh, time has you know, gone by, I've learned a lot of things, and I've had a dozen different small businesses over the years. But 11 years ago, um, I started a business almost by accident in my backyard. Built a small camping trailer, sold it on eBay 36 hours later, uh, just as, because I like to build things. and. Uh, and after it sold, the phone started ringing, emails started coming in saying, hey, did they buy it? Did they pay for it? If they, didn't, if they don't want it, I want to buy it. Will you build another one? I told my wife, I said, I don't know what I've stumbled into, but I might be on to something. <laughs> and uh, I said, you know what I'm going to do? I said, I'm going to commit to building 10 of these. And this was September 2012. I said, I'm going to commit to building 10 of these. I'll take orders through eBay if we sell seven by the end of the year. So, uh, then all of 2013, I told my wife, I said, I want you to keep me focused on this one thing for one year. And so we'll see what happens. And uh, December 31st, uh, 81-year-old gentleman called from San Antonio, Texas to order the last one. Wow. And uh, I told my wife, I said, well, it's game on. I said, uh, I said, you have to keep me focused because I've always dabbled in a little bit of everything. I've always been in business for myself. I've always been in business by myself. And... Uh, and in a matter of a few months, I realized I couldn't do this on my own anymore. I needed help. And so it's continued to grow. And so 11 years later, we literally have thousands of these camping trailers on the road nationwide, um, a few foreign countries. Um, been on the Price is Right show for a few seasons and their show, showcase showdown. Um, you know things like that, and so it's, it's grown phenomenally. You know, it's I, I just had to deal with my first workman's comp claim this morning on the oh, drive gosh. over here. So, you <laughs> know, eleven years, I guess that's pretty good. But uh, the first uh, first accident that a guy actually had to go uh, had to go to the hospital. So, uh, um, but it, it's just it's grown phenomen phenomenally. I've I've seen it grow, and and I've got a mind for how to make business decisions, you know, in a, in a manner that gets the job done. We are a debt-free company. Um, I started with $10,000. I told my wife, I said, I'll never borrow a dime for this business. It will grow itself or we'll shut it down. Um, we live the same way. We've been debt-free as a household for 20 years. Everything we own is paid for. Um, when all the Form 6s come out, you'll not find a mortgage in my name anywhere on the planet. Uh, we don't owe anybody a dime on anything business-wise or personal. And I live with that philosophy and I believe I'll take that to Tallahassee and hold them to the wire because no matter what it is, every single bill that will ever pass a state rep's desk is going to be connected to money. Mm -hmm. It's got to have a budget. It's somehow it's got to be paid for. And, and so how are we going to pay for it? Because there's only two ways you're going to pay for it. You either have to raise taxes, which I'll never vote to raise, or you're going to have to cut something else and take that money from something that's unproductive, take it from people that don't need to be paid to do nothing anymore, and, and yeah. quit the, the ridiculous spending that government is involved in and start scaling back. And so that's, that's my area of, of expertise, skill set. Um, I, I can get those kind of things done in, in a way that they probably won't like me very much. 
<laughs> but I'm not going there for people to like me. I'm going there to represent people that have have worked their fingers to the bone the same way as I have all my life, and that they know what it's like to struggle with bureaucracy. Uh, I've built, my wife and I have built seven homes of our own, and we've helped family members um, build homes. And when I say we've built our own home, it's not I contracted it, I built it um, with my bare hands. And so, uh, you know, I've gone down to DMV and felt like a criminal when I left. I've gone down <laughs> to the building department and, you know, and, and had them say, you can't do that. You've got to hire a, a, you know, a licensed contractor for that. And I've had to prove them wrong on so many different occasions because, you know, there are things that are in the Florida statutes for the benefit of our citizens. And you have to learn to interpret those things and, and fight for them and stand up for them in a way that benefits everybody that they're there for. Um, Business-wise, we've met challenges over and over again. Land Rover's attorneys tried to shut down a trademark. We've got mul multiple trademarks for our products. And, and they came at us against a camping trailer that we call the Range Runner. I got notification that, that Land Rover's attorneys were disputing our trademark, that we were infringing on Range Rover. <laughs> and <laughs> four years of litigation as pro se, <laughs> uh -huh. um, I did not give up and, uh, and held them to it time and time again until finally they backed off and they, and, and they quit. Um, you know, you have to fight for the American dream. It, you know, it's, and the American dream is not the American handout. It's not the mentality that, that, you know, people are buying into today that, you know, we just, we just come here for the American dream to be handed to us. You have to fight for that. And, and at this stage, our business has grown. And over the years, my, you know, I asked my son several years ago, my, my grown children, we have a 31 year, my son's 30. Three, I'm sorry, <laughs> my daughter's 24. Um, we have two new granddaughters, an 18 month old and a four month old. And um, several years ago, I asked my son, they had just started, he had just started working in the business. And a couple of years ago, my daughter came on board. And, uh, and I said to my son, I said, Justin, I said, uh, what, do you, what do you see here? You know, what, what are you thinking? in terms of our business. You know, a lot of people look at it as a family business that, mm -hmm. you know, is rare these days. Um, a, lot of, a lot of businesses start out and, you know, as the kids grow older, they don't have an interest in it. They, you know, they just, mm -hmm. well, all they're about is, hey, well, I want to make money. Mm -hmm. or, or maybe they just don't have an interest in that profession or trade. And, and, uh, and for us, it's just the opposite. Our, our kids love the business and, and the people and everything about it. And I said, Justin, what are you thinking we should do here? I said, because the business has a lot of potential. Um, it continues to grow, but I don't want to work forever. Uh, I said, so, you know, what are, what are your thoughts? And he said, you know, Dad, he said, uh, I, I've been thinking about this. He said, you know, it would really be cool that one of these days our grandchildren look back and tell people, you know, my family started this business. And when he said that, something, something triggered inside me that said, you know what, whatever we have to fight for mm -hmm. to make this happen, it's going to be an example to other people that come in and think that it can't be done or that's a thing of the past or, you know, that's old fashioned, or, you know, kids don't do that anymore. You know, so many people just want to become millionaires overnight on the internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he said that, it's, it sparked a fire in me, and I looked at him and I said, let's make it happen. And what I know is that what I've seen since I started the trucking business at 16 years old, without a chauffeur's license, um, by the way, <laughs> right, we got ex-law enforcement here. Um, <laughs> I, 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 don't know what, I don't know what my parents were thinking. I, I, would, I, I would leave, I, sometimes I'd leave Sunday night, late at night. I'd be driving up the East Coast, 16 years old, you know, uh, hauling, I, I, I don't even know how I got some of the contracts I did. I hauled train, train wheels and axles for Amtrak um, up the East Coast for them to refurbish them. I had a 
contract <laughs> hauling shipping containers down to Miami from a local oh, wow. um, um, building supply. That was, federal. They were sending federal. stuff. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, so uh, that was before the Twix cards were were uh, required. Um, so you know. No chauffeur's license. My dad just said, please be careful. <laughs> and, oh, my. Uh, and so, and God was with me. That's all I can say. Yeah. Um, that was big time. So, but what I saw is from there at 18, the day I turned 18, I was at, I was at the state trooper's office in, on Silver Springs Boulevard to get my chauffeur's license. There you go. And a year later, the CDL came out. And all of a sudden, requirements changed, and mm -hmm. you know all the all the all the things that you know you thought it was going to be easy. Now they're going to throw this on and a new test, and then the health requirements. You got to have a physical, and you got to do this, and you have to have a certain amount of insurance liability now for trucking mm -hmm. yeah. businesses that you you know you could get a buy buy with minimal coverage yeah. back then. They we're putting them out of business. And uh, mm -hmm. over and over, yeah. um, you know. The regulations have just continued to increase and make it more and more difficult for the small guy to come in and say, I just want to make a living. You know, I just want to provide for my family. I just want to do something that I'm passionate about, that I enjoy doing. I just want to build that American dream so that I have something to pass on to my children if they choose to. And, and, and so when this opportunity came up, I thought, you know, if... If my grandchildren, 20 years from now, are going to have any chance at all, we have got to step up and do something yeah. and fight for the American dream like we never have before. Yeah. So that's, right. yep. that's that's why I'm doing this, and that's what I bring to the table, and you know, I'll, awesome. I'll fight for it, whatever comes our way. That's awesome. <laughs> awesome. Outstanding. Very Thanks, good. Me. Both of you very so, good. Thank you. We have two candidates. Mm -hmm. Two candidates with two very different mm -hmm. points of focus, mm -hmm. both important. Yeah. Okay? So write down some questions that you want to ask each candidate. Now I'm going to start it off so you give you a chance to write. Okay? And this is for both of you. Are states facing several pressing problems that threaten the continued growth of our economy? One is the skyrocketing cost of property insurance. And the other is the overburdening, overtaxing of our infrastructure mm -hmm. by unbridled development. Mm -hmm. So what are your specific remedies for those problems? And again, we'll start with me. You said property taxes? Property okay. taxes. Property taxes and un unchecked growth. Our infrastructure is not able to keep up with it. I don't know, if, I'm, I'm sure it's where you live, but every every field is being developed. They're not, they can't keep up with the, with the schools and the roads and just hospitals. First responders, that's another one of my passions. They're already short stuff, there is, it's impossible. And, but the developers have more money and they're, they're dangling that carrot in front of our, our city and county commissioners and the only answer to that, now this is on a smaller level than state, but, and um, Steve had already talked about, we don't want any more, we, we are over-regulated, mm -hmm. but there has to be a cap on growth, that it has to be, there has to be a well thought out, um, what's the name for the plan, um, the growth, there's a plan that's for growth. Those have to be regulated somehow by the state so there's a consistent um, rate of growth that would keep up with the infrastructure. But until I believe that it's it's on the county level with their um, approvals and things like that, mm -hmm. that they have to put a put a foot down because they're looking at um, potentially well we need housing for all these people that are coming in. Mm -hmm. Well, where are you going to put their kids in school? Where are the roads that are congested? There has to be a plan, and it has to be on a county level. I strong, strongly believe on um, that local efforts make the, the greatest impact on a national, state and national scale. So there's, there are issues that the state can do to force regulation, but then the counties have to be autonomous, and it's ultimately up to the people that when you, you have to go to these county um, commission meetings and city council meetings, and object to these um, growth plans that are unsustainable. With property taxes, your nephew 
and um, Ryan Chamberlain proposed um, getting rid of the property taxes. I looked at it, his, um, his, his bill, I've looked at it, um, I just had questions like how are, how are um, counties supposed to pay their bills with that. I know that there were some answers in it, I have to look into it deeper. But we're being, it's not just property taxes and it's not just us unsustained growth, we're looking at insurance rates sky skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. Insurance, our insurance, um, not, our electric bills, the utilities are going to be skyrocketing. They're projecting by 2030, it's going to be five times the rate that we're seeing now mm -hmm. because of the insurance. Um, I have to get insurance out of my head. <laughs> Utility industries are, are unchecked too. So there has to be a balance between government regulations that hurt the small businesses and unsustained growth. And there's the answer is it's just it's going to be a long time coming because we have a mess now and we have decades to catch up to the growth that we have, mm -hmm. the the lack of the infrastructure, the crumbling bridges and things like that. I mean, it, it's so big. You have so many homeless people that you can't take care of. Mm -hmm. Schools that are falling apart. Um, it it just goes on and on and on, and it's all because there's no set plan to to. Um, Accommodate, like I said, all the all the growth. There is. And I think honestly that we need to close Florida for a while until it catches up. <laughs> Just close Florida. Don't let anybody else in because we can't handle them. And I don't know if I answered your question, but it's bigger than that. Can I follow. expand on that after you? A quick follow-up. Mm -hmm. Because of the unique nature of your house district, uh -huh. okay, spanning multiple counties. Do you see a regional approach to that overdevelopment? Because the roads that we use in Lake County go right into Marion County, right. go right into Volusia County. Yes. So I see it as a regional problem. It is. And Central Florida is getting hammered. Yes, we are. Yes, so we are. We're going to turn into another Miami. Do yeah. you see exactly. a regional approach to the problem? I think it needs to be not just a regional approach to it, I think it needs to be a more, it needs to be a statewide approach to it because it's affecting more than just that district, so yes. But we, uh, Marion Lake Volusia, a lot of the uh, district is very rural areas. So we have a lot of the forest and, things, and there's so much poverty there, but like I said, you go and they're plowing down all the forest areas. Mm -hmm. And um, that means I know um, Wilton Simpson, the um, Ag Commissioner, he's, he's trying, he's just working hard to preserve the the look of Florida. We're losing horse farms in um, mm -hmm. North Marion County, mm -hmm. which is there's some in my in in the district, but it's just it's it's got to be the people going to the the county commission meetings and city and learning about what they're doing and what's their plan and how they're dealing with the growth and standing up for it and then calling state legislators too to. Um, there just has to be some regulation with it. And no, I don't have the answers. I see the problem and see the potential solutions, but not if everybody's on the same board. I'd like to expand on that. Uh, I've mm -hmm. been going to county and city council meetings for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And the, when you say it's a local issue, it isn't because the state has passed a number of regulations that ham, you know, hamstring uh -huh. the county yeah, and the city. Because we now. just had the Tavares City Council this week, and there were 30 plus people showed up about a uh, new proposed development on Highway 19, and uh, the uh, and, and for once I expected the City Council to cave and go with the developer, but they stood up to him and they denied. And this is the second time they've been there, but the problem is now there is a new state law called Live Local Act. Yep. And it will let the developer, and the developer even threatened them and said, if you don't pass this, we under Live Local, which what it does is it allows people to, um, the developer, to buy commercial or existing commercial um, or resident, not residential, commercial and industrial land. Uh, and they can develop it without even posting any notices. Yep. They have no requirement to notify the no neighbors, unlike current. You know, no oversight proposals, and so that's probably what they're going to do. Uh, the, the city council, I think, may have enough people. They're going to stand up to them in court or something. <coughs> but I don't think they're going to win. Uh, 
Well, I'm, I looked into, I mean, our research heavily the Lube Local Act, and I've seen nothing but complaints from cities yeah. and county commissions that they've lost all say-so with it, and that it's just allowing developers to come in and just build more. I know we, we had a win, back to um, your comment, we had a win jumble air. It's all this, this um, just, I don't know how many acres it is mm -hmm. of just farmland and whatever, but the citizens stood up. Um, John Travolta, that was his property, he hired attorneys to fight for it, and they tabled it. So they, they have it postponed. It's not over yet, but at least they listened. What will you do, though? I didn't hear anything in there about what you were committed to do to probably solve this problem. Well, you have to you have to repeal laws like the live lo local because it has okay, to Okay, is that a commitment from you that you would work towards doing that? That's what I'm getting at. Yes. Yes, okay. absolutely. Do whatever I can to give the counties more autonomy, but they also have to have some structure to follow because too many of them are, are looking at the bucks and not the landscape and they're not listening to the people. And that, is, overall, that has to change. Steve, you're yeah. there. <laughs> you're you're over. Over. Well, we I should go first next time I so can, that he doesn't have to bounce off the board. <laughs> yeah, uh, I can yeah. do a lot of that. Uh, you know, I'm very much in line with that. Um, you know, Florida's growth has gotten out of hand for decades. It's not something that just happened overnight. It's crept up on us. And, um, and so, and I was, I was in Tallahassee not too long ago speaking with um, developers and, and a head over Florida's Department of Transportation and, and talking about what do you do to fix roads because every, everybody, everybody squawks about the rural areas and we want to protect our farmlands. And, and they don't want to put roads through, they don't want to develop and, and everything. And the truth is, is I 100% agree, I want us to protect um, our, our rural lands. The Greenway, you know, and, and the Cross Florida Barge Canal that has been protected all the way across the entire state. You know, the Ocala National Forest, we got all, all this protected area. And yet, you know, for us, right in the middle of the state, you can't get to one side of the state or the other without passing through any one of our counties. Marion, Lake, and, you know, Volusia County, Sumter County, you know, you've got to go right through all these counties to get anywhere. And, and so, you know, nobody wants to develop the land, but you don't have a choice. You have to funnel traffic through. Mm -hmm. If you're going to keep the economy rolling, then you have to be able to keep not just cars, but transportation rolling in the form of trucks and, you know, and being able to move goods across the state. Florida has a big problem. Florida produces very little. And, and so we have, and I have, I know it in my business because I have truckers that call me on a regular basis, do you have any campers that you're shipping out? Because we ship them, we have dealers in other parts of the country. Um, where we don't have dealers, we'll ship them to, you know, to a, a city for a customer. Do you have anything going out? Because we have trucks coming in here every single day and they have to leave empty. Because Florida doesn't produce enough to keep the trucks rolling and so it costs more to have goods brought into Florida because they're leaving empty. They, have, they, you know, they make absolutely no revenue when they leave the state. And so they'll have to leave here, go to another state, and pick up a load in Georgia, or Louisiana, or somewhere that's producing something to at least pay for their mileage to get back home so they can come back and do it all over again. And so, you know, having the infrastructure in place for, you know, for transportation that produces revenue is critical. And yet, the growth is, we're already overgrown. We, we have too many, I agree, I think we just need to say, you know, Florida's full, Florida's full. Yeah. Florida, and, yeah. and, and people shudder at that, and they think, well, you can't do that. Well, you can do that, you know, and, and it takes somebody to be able to draw the line and say, um, with, with, I mean, developers are building homes for what? For money, yeah. I mean that's that they're in the business for money. But we're at a we're at a stage, I believe, in this economy where we're going to see another 07 hit, mm -hmm. and things are going to tank. And yeah. you know, and we've and here we have um, county commissions and local uh, governments that have approved new developments to go in. Mm -hmm. 
that aren't even being built yet. In, in Marion County, we have Silver Spring Shores. That was developed back in the 70s. It was all subdivided and everything back in the 70s with the grand scheme of being something like today's villages, but it never happened. And so now we have thousands and thousands of undeveloped lots out in Silver Spring Shores that by all rights are already subdivided and you can build houses on. Why are we approving new subdivisions? Why are we approving new places for, for contractors to go in and, and build more housing in, in other areas when there's still a lot of approved places to build homes that hasn't been filled up yet? Let's, let's be true to our people and follow through with what, what's been approved and what we have to do before we start approving new subdivisions, new plans, new developments, and and just let things grow at an organic pace. So, you know, there's there's ways that you can shut it down, and if you open up the Florida statutes to the building codes and the development codes, guess where all guess where all the responsibility falls mm -hmm. on bureaucrats. Yeah. It, it's all you know in the hands of bureaucracy. You know, and here we've elected officials to go up here and make decisions and say, you know, here's, here's the things that we're going to do in the best interest of our people. We make all these decisions, and then you go into the Florida statutes, and it literally says a bureaucrat has the right to make the decision. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, you know, we're, we're struggling. We'll always struggle with that problem, but somewhere we have to be able to draw the line. And say yes, you know we're going to catch up to things. Before. Let me ask the same yes. question because she had to un go un through my grilling. Is the, <laughs> the uh, what will you commit to do to control uh, traffic and uh, like for and the uh, the ability for the counties to make their own decisions because there are a lot of laws and there are lawsuits and other things that prevent them from doing that. But since she talked about the Live Local Act, what will you do about the Live Local Act? I, I absolutely despise the Live Local Act right now. And um, yeah. I, I've talked with City Council in DeBerry. They are, they are dealing with a major mess because of the Live Local Act right now. Mm -hmm. Where a developer came in and they said, hey, you know, we want to we build this, this community. And here's what we're gonna here's what we're gonna do, here's what we're gonna offer. And they you know, and they get it passed, they get it approved, and then six months after they get the project approved, they decide they want to change the project. And now a lot of the amenities and things that they were gonna offer the the community now, well they just pulled back on that and all we're gonna do is the housing. And and, and so, so as long as thirty percent of that housing fits mm -hmm. into what's called affordable. It doesn't have, it's not low income, mm -hmm. it's what's called affordable. As long as 30% of that falls into affordable housing, then they don't have to pay property taxes on that 30%. And, and so the developer comes in, well, come to find out in the current market, affordable housing is actually $200 a month more than what they're currently charging. So they can go from $1,100 to $1,300 <laughs> a month without having to pay taxes on the property. Which, which causes everybody else in the community, uh, private landowners, to have to do what? Pay more. Pay more that's right. So now we've got to go in and we have to raise property tax. And, and DeBerry has one of the lowest property taxes in the state. So now they've got to start raising their property taxes on, on long-term residences to make up the difference for a developer that's come in and, and taken advantage of the system. I'm yeah. against it 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't how, I don't know how it even got through. But like I said earlier, I'm a, I'm a penny pincher. So, you know, and, and I feel for the guy that's been working hard to pay his property taxes at the end of the year. I'm going to fight for that and, and do what we have to do to, to cut it. Along the lines of insurance, though, that was mentioned. Yes. Um, I wanted to go there myself. So, you know, prop, it's not just property insurance. Insurance, the, the whole industry has been hit hard because of greed. Both contractors' greeds, mm -hmm. litigation, attorneys getting on the bandwagon mm -hmm. of, you know, Morgan and, not just Morgan and Morgan, oh, Morgan, and Morgan. but everybody that wants to be a little mini Morgan, yeah. you know, 
And now all of a sudden, I think good meaning attorneys have been sucked into that money making mm -hmm. scheme, mm -hmm. thinking, well, you know, they're making it, I'm going to make it. And next thing you know, we're, you know, we're constantly fighting legal battles. And, you know, and I still use the trucking industry as an example because trucks are required a minimum of a million dollars coverage in liability. Mm -hmm. Well, who's. They don't care if you've been hit by a car. The first thing they're going to ask is, what was the sign on the side of that truck? Mm -hmm. yep. give, me the, give me the company's name on the side That's of that right. truck yeah. because they know the minimum levels of insurance that they can go after. Mm -hmm. And so when Dan gets you a million dollars, guess what? It was no problem for Dan to do it mm -hmm. because, you know, by law, they're required to, to live up to their levels of insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, you have people that are... That are Doing that, I, for the first time in my life, I feel compassion towards the insurance industry. Uh, homeowners, I, I have it, probably everybody in here, if you haven't got it, you know somebody that got a new roof on their house. Yep. Okay? If you have, a, a, if you have ten houses in a, in a neighborhood, mm -hmm. and this guy calls up and says, Hey, you know, this roofer just said he could get me a new roof. All I had to do was sign these papers. He'd come out and, and mm -hmm. do an estimate and get me a new roof. Neighboritis. Come, comes out mm -hmm. and says, hey, um, yeah, you got three shingles off of there. You need a new roof. Mm -hmm. So, and not only do you need a new roof, a $15,000 roof is now going to cost you $45,000 because mm -hmm. they can, because the insurance company will pay for it. Mm -hmm. And your premium is $1,500 on that house for a year. Mm -hmm. And your neighbor just got a $45,000 roof. How many houses do you have to go down the line before somebody else gets a new roof. Mm -hmm. they, they can only go so long before it just sucks them dry. And so you can't blame insurance companies for raising their rates if they're being taken, but I believe that there's a way to, to draw the line legislatively and give them the right to set caps on their insurance. Yes. When you deregulate certain industries, mm -hmm. they, take, they take control. You know, if you're not falling under regulation, it's my business, I'm going to protect my business. Yeah. I'm going to do what I have to do to say, wait a minute, you don't get a new roof, you get three shingles. Yeah. That's what you get on your 20-year-old roof. Yeah. You, you get a repair, that's what the insurance is there for. It's there so in case of need, it takes care of it. It's not there so you can just rape the system. That's right. And so for too long, it's been taken advantage of by greed and... Uh, and I believe there's ways that you can. Well, Florida can stop is the most that. litigious state I've ever seen, mm -hmm. and you're talking. Yes. You're talking to a 20-year adjuster here. Right. So I worked for an insurance company for a long time, and that's exactly what's happening. That's why everyone's rate right. is going up, is because of all the fraud. Right. And when you go to the insurance company and you only need three shingles and you are fighting for an entire roof. That's fraud. Right. That's outright fraud. But the problem is, it would cost that insurance company so much money if right. you take them to court. You that's shouldn't have why to they, take them to court. That's just it. And it's business. That's what I'm saying. Yep. So, yeah, it is the Morgans and Morgans that people mm -hmm. should be blaming, not the insurance companies. Because right. insurance Maybe companies make about yeah. six... They make about six cents on the dollar, right. and they do that by investing the money. So everybody thinks insurance companies make a ton of money. Right. Well, they don't. And when the stock markets tank, the insurance companies, their investments tank as well. Is there a question there? The, no, <laughs> there's not. There's not. So It was confirmation. She's so running for office. Well, it's confirmation, yeah. but I also yeah. want them, if they go to Tallahassee, to understand what the real problem is, right. it's it's litigation. Right. That's the bottom line with all of these insurance yes. prices going up. And uh, you know, workman's comp, same thing. Yep. Uh, yes. The tort reform is huge. Yeah. So you know, just because you get hurt on the job means you get coverage. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you were smoking pot. It doesn't matter if you <laughs> did you you were told to wear a hard hat, but you didn't. Right. You know. Somewhere along the line, people have to be accountable for their own actions, too, That's right. That's right. because there again, it falls right into that place mm -hmm. of, of abuse, claim abuse, and fraud. That's right. And so, next. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I had a 
I had an, all, an other side of the story for insurance. They did a study on um, why insurance, um, a research agency did a study on why insurance rates are so high. And one of the biggest reasons they found is because the CEOs are getting billions of dollars in bonuses and they're, they have sure. multiple houses and multiple pieces of property. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things. And that means, you know, what are you what supposed to do? You could regulate the profits, you could cap the profit sharing or the bonuses they get. Mm -hmm. But so they're complaining, they're pulling out of the state and one of the things they're pulling out because they're not able to get as many bonuses or they're milking the, the, um, their own insurance companies dry. And I'll have, to, I'll have to find that research. But another thing is with the, with the roofs, my in-laws own a subdivision. And they're being, they were being forced to replace all the roofs by the insurance company. Mm -hmm. They had to replace every single unit's roofs, even though there were perfectly good ones. They had a couple damaged in a, in a storm that were covered with tarp. But the insurance company was forcing them to do this. Mm -hmm. And so you have that aspect too. So there's a whole, there are a whole bunch of players in our insurance company mess, and everyone, every comment was true, and it all adds together that you have an out of control industry that's taking advantage of Florida's um, wacky weather, Florida on hormones. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it, yes, there are billions of dollars in damages for hurricanes and things like that, but for the most part most of the state is left untouched. Mm -hmm. So instead of making them pay more for, you know, you live on the coast, you're going to have storm damage, of course, in a high hurricane um, landfall area. Have them pay for those. They're affecting the whole state. So there have been um, band-aids on, uh, legislators have been <coughs> working and working on how to get the insurance um, rates down for, because people are just canceling their insurance. They're, they're self-insured, more or less. Mm -hmm. So they have the state insurance, which was never intended to be the volume that it is now. <laughs> never intended to be. They're going to go broke. So there's a new, um, I haven't checked to see where this bill is, but one of the legislators, um, uh, it, there's a new segment of the state insurance for just wind mitigation. So if you have wind damage or whatever, or you can't get that coverage, you can get it. And there are other, there's, there's just so many different things and it seems to just be a band-aid on the real problem. They're, they're putting a band-aid on a, a cut artery, you know. So there's so much work to be done, but it has to take the um, legislators and working with the insurance um, regulators to, to get some caps on these damages. And there are people too, when you talk about fraud in insurance claims, but then there are people who have actual damage and they can't get their insurance mm -hmm. company to cover it. Or they're afraid to claim it a legitimate high cost because their insurance will go up. Mm -hmm. And with workman's comp too, mm -hmm. we've also seen people who aren't getting their their damage or their injuries covered because of the insurance industry. So it's a mess and it's gonna take getting in there and working on it with the with the experts in the field because I'm not an expert in the insurance field or whatever, but you have to learn. And just the things that I've read, it, there are people working on it, and there's no real solutions anytime soon. Mm -hmm. right. so, okay. That was my little... Thank you. All right, this is, this is an interesting question. I like this question. Mm -hmm. Neither of you are incumbents. So if either of you are elected, you're going to be a freshman mm -hmm. legislator. Mm -hmm. Okay. How are you going to battle the attitude in Tallahassee that says you are new here, therefore you cannot bring that issue to the table, and if you do, you will fail? Mm -hmm. How do you battle that? Steve, you're up first. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. Um, Sounds like you. I, I came <laughs> into this thing with nothing to prove, and so, like I said, I'm not going there to make make friends and go in there to represent the people. Um, I won't know how to answer that question until I'm in the in the heat of it. But I do know that I don't quit. Um, you know, if I'm convicted to, you know, buy something, to do something, 
Yeah. Same way with a you know with a lawsuit with Land Rover and their attorneys. You know when somebody throws something at you and says you can't do it. When a bureaucrat says you can't do your own house plans because you have to have a licensed engineer. I'm sorry, uh, that doesn't compute with me. The Florida statutes say that I have this right, and I have it here in black and white. And you're going to have to allow me to do this because it's my right to do it. That's what I'm here for. I was elected to represent these people. Now, in all honesty, I'll get seven bills. Each representative will get seven bills. You know, you're not, you can't go and just pick and choose any old thing you want to fight for. You know, you'll they'll, they'll they'll give you things that says here's you know here's what you were up against. Here's some things you need to choose from and and what you need to um, you know to go in here and and stand up for. And you have to kind of pick and choose. Every representative has to do that. On the other hand, you're given unlimited repeals. So <laughs> so and I'm all about deregulating. I'm all about hey let's 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 get the government out of our noses. Let's get them out of our hair and. You know, let's get back to being free. So, you know, I really want to go there and just start saying, I think it's time we cut this out. Why do we need this? Why? What are we doing this for? Mm -hmm. You know, it's making it harder and harder on the people. And, you know, I think we can repeal this. And and so that'll uh, that'll probably be more of my approach. But, yeah, you're, you're only going to get seven bills in the course of a year and let give or take. But, you know, that's... That's it, and and so you really have to choose out of those seven. How hard are you going to fight for them? Mm -hmm. uh, if they put it on my desk and say, "Hey, you know, we're going to let you fight this," you lay it on my desk, buddy. I'm going to give it everything I got because you just put me in this position to do it. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, makes sense. Becky, okay. makes sense. So I have a, a similar but different take. Remember what I <coughs> talked about when written amendments for the SB 7050. Well, we found out at the time how Tallahassee really works and probably states all over the country is there's an, there's an upper hierarchy and you have the legislators and if the upper hierarchy administrative state, if they don't want a bill on the floor, they don't want it to go through, they won't put it out to the committees. And there's nothing a legislator can do about it. The difference is I'm a, I'm a fighter. I won't back down. I never have. I've been sent to the emergency room. I can't tell you how many times during my career, but I always got, the person always went to jail. So I never back <laughs> down. Yeah. I have stories too, if you ever want to hear them. Oh, yeah. They're the coolest stories. But anyway, so knowing what I know, and I'll tell you what, none of us know what really goes on up there. And the legislators don't really know what goes on behind closed doors. That has to that has to stop. The difference is between what, and I'm not demeaning um, Representative Roth at all. He's awesome. But what I was upset and concerned that he didn't do is he didn't shout it from the rooftops, hey, everybody, I'm doing this publicly. We worked hard with you for hundreds of hours over the course of weeks. And I was doing my job, but I am being forced to withdraw this bill because the people upstairs aren't letting me. Now you you'll end up getting the Sabatini treatment. You know he got he got all of his he got mm -hmm. removed from his committees, yeah. and I even heard that he got a desk at the basement level mm -hmm. as as a you didn't you know you you weren't playing the rule by the rules that we said, yeah. you're going to be, and it was a, a symbolic gesture mm -hmm. that he was, but the, who loved him, who loves him, the people do, because he went to bat for us. And the first way you change the top culture is to expose it. James Madison said that the people are the only true fountain of power, and he was right, and we have to, we handed that power over to the government, mm -hmm. and it should not be so big. We are, we have a Florida swamp. And it's going to take people like, and you may not know this, but Steve and his wife Deidre and my husband and I have gotten to be friends. We're not at the going out to dinner level yet because we're so busy. <laughs> <laughs> we've got to be friends. See, and we good. talked about it from, from the get-go. Mm -hmm. We agreed that we weren't going to have an ugly 
cam we weren't going to have an ugly campaign. We weren't running one. We weren't going to throw mud at each other. That's good. We were going to stand on our own um, strengths. Mm -hmm. And over this, over these several months that we've even shared information or whatever, and we came to an agreement that one of us has is going to win. Mm -hmm. Well, then you have the third guy, but one of us is going to win, and I will back him if he wins. And the stuff that I become an expert on with elections, mm -hmm. he's going to be my go-to, and he's going to—I'm going to fill him in on every single thing, mm -hmm. and vice versa. He's stronger with the business regulations and things like that, and I know he'd be my um, support system for that. Yeah. As 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 a as an extra, it's almost like um, representative for District 27A and then B, maybe. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> but this is something that. The people deserve, and it's yeah. the law, that we have the right to know the workings of our government. And every single issue that we've been, been discussing, that we're like, we don't, we don't know how to fix it. We don't know. That shouldn't be it. There are things going on behind closed doors. You're talking about our electric rates. And I can say it, um, Mr. Gentry isn't here, Richard, I'm pointing to you, sorry. Yeah. Richard Gentry is the third Republican that put his name in the hat. Mm -hmm. He was a um, public counsel for the Public Service Commission. His job in Tallahassee was to advocate for the people against the utility companies. He was supposed to speak on our behalf, okay? So when he was, he ended up being appointed by the government, by the governor, the only one that was um, out of, I think, three other people. He was the only one left standing. And when he was put in, and I'm not saying that he was totally responsible for it, but at that time, FBL got one of the biggest rate hikes in the history in their history. The Florida Supreme Court challenged him on it, as did other legislators. You had one job. Why didn't you do? It? You know, you had one job. You were supposed to be an advocate for the people, and now, because of that, and there was other issues too that were dug out because of this. The the um the campaign donations to legislators and the governor, the ties to solar and things like that that um, involved several um, legislators. All of this, there's so much big money and behind closed doors mm -hmm. things. That has to stop. That has to stop. And I can speak for myself and I can probably speak for Steve too, that we are the most incorruptible. There is no chance that somebody's going to come up and offer a million dollars for us to vote a certain way. You know, there is no chance. And so that's something you have to do, too. You have to look at who's going to represent you. You have to get people who are actually going to be your representatives who have no ties to the government. And we have to get in there and we have to expose what's going on and be transparent about it. We have to be able to do it so we still have a seat at the table, too. Like you don't go in swinging the bat because mm -hmm. then you will lose your committees. Yeah. So that's my, that's my take on it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah. All right, we are now back to a question, or actually a two-part question, about election integrity. And because that's your strong suit, I'm going to let Steve go first. <laughs> and the question is, what will you commit to to improve Florida election integrity and the non-cooperative supervisors of elections, A, and B, what will you do to thoroughly investigate election machine and software integrity? Well, I might have to rely on my 2A community to go down to the, election, to, the, to the Office of Elections and say, uh, we want to see your record. Um, you know, I am... I, I, I believe there's no reason that we cannot have ballots hand counted. And, and <coughs> run them through a machine if you want, but have every single ballot validated by a Democrat and Republican side by side that say, hey, you know, we're, we're here, and, and I know you won't have any problem getting volunteers to do it. Mm -hmm. it you know, it's, it's on both sides. You know that, you know that would be the case. So, you know, all of, I mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't dug deep into, you know, different things I would do. I haven't been an activist in that, in that area. But all along, I mean, since, since the election was stolen <laughs> the first time, uh, you know, I've always said, well, what's the problem? 
get two people together mm -hmm. and hand count every ballot to go. I guarantee you, you can hand count those ballots faster than people are are bringing them to to the machine. Mm -hmm. uh, if, it doesn't take that many volunteers when you got ten voting machines. It will not take very many volunteers to be able to keep up with that pace as they go through. So, I mean, I'm, I'd, I'd be more of a strong advocate for hand counting ballots uh, than anything else. So, uh, that's in the simple. I, I think let's keep it simple. Thank you. Becky. Okay, so there's the Florida Supervisors of Elections Association. There is already a bill that was presented um, that allowed supervisors of elections to hand count the ballots. The FSE Association is fighting that. They're saying it's impossible to do. It would never be accurate. You need the machines. Well, did you know that none of the machines that um, Florida uses, I don't know if it's across the country, but there, there is no manufacturer, there is no American, United States manufacturer of um, election machines anywhere. They're all from out of the country. Okay, so there's... I'm getting calls from flyers I put out. They're going to have to wait. <laughs> okay, so that that has to change too. If you're going to have a machine, and it's going to it's going to be a while. I, I believe that every ballot should be hand counted too. That it's doable. Other countries do it. We can do it too. Get rid of the machines. I think that it has to be um, same same day voting. There doesn't need to be an election season because the more days you have, the more time they have to cheat. But there, it goes back to what I was saying. There has to be transparency. There has to be citizen oversight. No matter what we have, what system we have with our elections, you have to be able to have people come in. The law says that the public can oversee the election, mm -hmm. that we can, mm -hmm. we can um, verify signatures and things like that. Let me tell you my experience. So it was um, the 22 or special election. Um, last year, I went to Marion County. I, I signed up. They only allowed, for a candidate, they only allowed one person to come in. And I was uh, given um, 30 minutes to inspect. I think there was um, there were thousands of ballots at the time. It was a small turnout. It was uh, maybe 3,000 ballots. I was given 30 minutes, me. Okay? So they put the ballot the ballot in, that was voted here and they put the comparison signature next to it so I could look at the signatures. I was able to do 32 in 30 minutes, 32 out of all of that. I challenged the last one because here's the ballot that was voted in that election. Here's a comparison signature. The comparison signature, the name was spelled wrong. Mm. So it's like, hold on, somewhere along the line somebody put in a fraudulent ballot and spelled that person's name wrong. I challenged it. Mm -hmm. I had to watch my words though, because if you fraudulently challenge a ballot, you can get arrested for it. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? If they mm -hmm. say that you that it was um, unreasonable, that's a that's against the law. So I said I disagree. I don't. There's a problem with that signature. And the supervisor of election is standing next to me, and he said, Yeah, I agree. Let's <laughs> let's check it out. So the canvassing board is in behind windows. There's a computer like for me to sue, okay, through a window. They had the screen of the computer facing away from me. He turned on the mic so I was supposed to be able to hear him. It was completely staticky. So he showed them the, the one I challenged, the comparison signature and the ballot. And then I saw them. He's explaining them. He's like <coughs> doing this. And all I could see was I couldn't hear anything. But he came out and said that they agreed with him, that it was probably an error on the voters' part. It wasn't just misspelled, it was a completely different signature. Mm -hmm. So the one I was allowed out of an entire special election, and that was it, that's not public oversight. Mm -hmm. That's the opposite of public oversight, and they might as well covered up their windows with cardboard. Mm -hmm. That has to change. If we had true oversight and transparency of our elections, most of the stuff we're seeing right now would not be happening. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, and I'm going to ask Steve first okay. again, Becky, because you and I are way into this. So I don't know how many people in this room are aware that our machines have not been certified since 2005 and our Secretary of State is okay with that. How are you going to fix that? <laughs> <laughs> 
And it, and it goes back to what you said earlier, or I guess Becky said it. Cord Bird, I don't think understands, our Secretary of State doesn't understand, he, he is the ruler, he's the president of our supervisors of elections. So how do we, <laughs> along with Maria Matthews, who is the <coughs> State Attorney General, or no, she's the, whatever she is. Director. They right. both Watch know this. the machines have not been certified since 2005, right. and they are okay with that. So how would you bring to their attention or bring to the other legislators' attention who don't know, senators, reps, whatever, how would you bring that to their attention to make them understand this is something that has to be done. There, I mean, your Apple be. phone is updated <coughs> how many times exactly. a week? Exactly. So, you know, that's uh, when you go to a gas pump, they, they've been inspected, and they have the date and everything of when it was inspected. When you get in an elevator, <laughs> that elevator has an inspection certificate. Mm -hmm. When you ride a ride at the amusement park, or you go to the grocery store and you buy apples, for Pete's sake, mm -hmm. that scale has to be certified and regulated on a regular basis. That's how I would, that's how I would tell them they need to put something in the, in the system that says, these have to be done on an annual basis or on a on a regular. If we have election every two years, uh -huh. for crying out loud, if if you went to the grocery store and you bought five pounds of apples, uh -huh. and you went and paid for five pounds of apples, and you come and find out that you only got four pounds and three ounces, most people would have a raging fit over that. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that'll be the hope. Yeah. So. Yeah, they, they should they should have them regulated the same way as they do any other machine that's expected to regulate trade in any way. So. Yeah, I didn't I didn't I went down a rabbit trail, but all of the election laws that our good legislators have um, entered <laughs> into this session, all of them are postponed. Some of them haven't even been looked at since January and won't be heard during this session session and probably will never all of the good ones thankfully the bad ones are there was a uh, legislation pending that changed the electoral college to the popular vote um there was um one well the one that everybody the intimidation and harassment mm -hmm. bill has been tabled until the next session and i don't know i know that um lake county um rec has really been pushing for people to fight this from a law enforcement aspect, the word uh, intimidation, that's the scariest statute I've ever seen. Yeah, it is. Intimidation is subjective. Yes. It's highly subjective. The gentleman that just walked in the door, I could say that he intimidated me because he walked in with a resting angry face. Mm -hmm. You know, I could say that. Mm -hmm. And because of this statute, mm -hmm. the intimidation, the perception of it, far outweighs the mm -hmm. actual intent of the other person. Mm -hmm. They increased the um, level of the uh, criminal, the criminal level, how did I forget that one, To from misdemeanor to felony. Okay, so what it is, it's targeting poll volunteers, it's targeting mm -hmm. citizens, it's making you afraid to walk in the door of a, an election office mm -hmm. to oversee an election. Mm -hmm. And so that has to be fought more than you think that you need to fight it mm -hmm. because of the potential there. Well, the interesting thing about that, for those of you who don't know, is there is already an harassment mm -hmm. language yes. in yep. our constitution, or not our constitution. Florida law. In yes. Florida law. Mm -hmm. So it's already there. Why are you making special laws against citizens right. who are asking legitimate questions about why is this in your voter rule, why has this machine not been um, certified since 2005. This is, <laughs> this is not something that needs to be relegated to us harassing election workers because that's not what we're doing. We're asking questions. Our favorite legislators are backing the bill. Okay. Representative Roth was speaking out in favor of it. I don't think he understands what they're doing. They don't. Uh -uh. They don't. Uh -uh. Yeah. And without us being able to ask the questions, no yes. one will be able to understand. Mm -hmm. So we need to be in Tallahassee when it, if it if it comes back to the next session, 
so we can have more time to explain the issues with that. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. I don't have any more written questions. Are there any that I missed? Uh, I'll just ask one verbally and it's not too bad. Uh, <laughs> I go to all the cities, uh, as I mentioned, I've been to all 14 cities and the county and the school district. <laughs> and uh, one of the things is that the local control is an issue. We talked a bit about it on traffic uh, or zoning, but um, there's there's a big, the, the state has lobbyists that go in there and they pass a law. And I'll give you an example is mobile home parks. I did an investigation for my blog on mobile home parks and how maybe 5% of the homeowners are bullies. And what they do is they harass and intimidate uh, elderly people, mostly women or veterans, and well, there isn't much else, but uh, in those parks, in the low income parks, so that they get up, they get frustrated, and they just abandon their home. Mm -hmm. And then the park owner files paperwork with the, uh, uh, the government to get ownership of that, of that home, and then they resell it or they rent it out. Um, and or they are forcing people out so that they don't have to pay them funds if they end up selling the whole park to be built into apartment complex or something which is called a land use change and all of that is local people because I talked to them all the police department the sheriff uh, the county the county attorney they do not have any ability to investigate people like that when a local person uh, complains because there's a law, Florida law, that supersedes all local control and uh, you have to file a complaint with that agency up there in Tallahassee and they have only two investigators, they won't come out in the field, they basically just turn around and then tell the park owner, well so and so complained, can you tell me what it is, and then so he harasses them more. Yeah. Okay. And so those are the kinds of things that are going on constantly and they hamstring uh, people, in this case mobile homes, but you've got uh, co-ops, uh, you've got uh, HOAs, they have similar situations. So what would you do to maybe bring the control back to the local cities or the counties? That was a bunch. <laughs> yeah. You may figure something. So, I, I think I got it. There's a whole lot of stuff there, information that you can Well, basically, is local but, control or but, not. But it is, you know, and I think a lot of communities are, they're devaluing the low-income, you know, areas of town. Um, the necessity of the trailer parks and, the, you know, the sides of community where people can't afford to pay $1,200 a month. Mm -hmm. Um, rent, to, but where are they going to live? You know, you you can't you can't push these people out of a community because where are they going to go if you do? And um, and so that's a that's always going to be a challenge. I think local government is is many times at fault for saying, hey, we're going to clean up this town. Well, let me clarify. Okay, well, I'm, we're talking so, about state law being used, and local can't do anything about it. And that, for instance, if you could call and complain about harassment to the local police and they had the ability to research compliance with the Florida law and mobile home parks, they could do something, but they're not allowed to do that. So that's what I'm talking about is uh, putting a hammer down on, and, and giving the local control back, um, not only in that area, but others, whether it's highways and so forth. Can't get red lights because the state won't do it. I'm wondering if you can get like ombudsman to intercede in cases like that. So not necessarily go to your local county or city or whatever, but I know the ombudsman program uh, has a lot of weight with the state. And they go in to actually uh, advocate for the senior citizens and for the low income and for the, the veterans and, and people like that. I've used ombudsman myself for my brother who's in an assisted living facility. And they, when they walk in, uh, the facilities take notice because now they have to answer to the state right. 
because of this ombudsman program. So I'm wondering if that might be a better utilization. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are laws uh, that you can't go in and bully the senior citizens or dis disabled people or, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's maybe just use the laws that are in place. Just an observation. Sure. Well, I mean, somebody's, somebody's got to look out for them, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in a community like that. And it's, it's unfortunate because the low income doesn't always have somebody to fight for them. That's right. You know, and, you know, <coughs> Local communities shouldn't have to fight the state um, or s state regulations. It's uh, like we were talking about building codes and everything earlier. All this, <coughs> all this um, authority is given to local bureaucrats to, you know, to enforce certain building codes, building regulations, and and that's a statewide statute. So. So the same thing should be similar in just about every, um, you know, sector of a local community. Mm -hmm. If you give that local community authority to make those decisions, then it, it no longer becomes a state decision. Mm -hmm. and it's, <laughs> it, if you go down to Marion County to pull a building permit for something for, you know, a shed, for a house, for a driveway or whatever, uh, you go in there to pull that permit, that local building official has the authority to interpret the the use of that <coughs> land and whether or not they'll issue a permit and it may be completely different from Lake County's interpretation mm -hmm. but by Florida statute they use those those few little words that say you know the code is defined by the local building official mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so you know, in every other, in every sector in society, I mean, they, they should have the same thing in place that says, you know, hey, we're standing here, you know, to back up our local residents to make sure that they're cared for properly, to make sure they're not bullied, and, you know, we have every right to do so. So, um, so you're talking about, there's, there's a, you know, there's a difference between civil and criminal law, and a lot of it's, a lot of it has to do with intent. But with um, what you were talking about, it appears to me to be more of a civil matter, it's where you would have to chapter take somebody, 723 yes, of Florida. Yes, you would have to take somebody to court. So your local law enforcement, all they can tell you is this is a civil matter. You have to either get a private attorney or report it to the state, and you know where that goes. It goes nowhere. I agree with your point. I think that there needs to be more local um, citizen um, advocacy and mediation groups that work between the residents and county government and that also work with state government to solve issues like this. It's a deeper issue than you um, know and you might be aware, but you've also got BlackRock and Vanguard, things like mm -hmm. that, that are buying up, they're forcing small owners out, mm -hmm. private owners, they're buying up property, they're either tearing it down and building the the big houses and the goal is you will own nothing and be happy and I thought that was a conspiracy theory. Is that me? No. I thought that was a conspiracy theory but it's true because they are after my in-laws, my husband's um, part of it, they're after their com um, apartment complex and it's it's blocks of um, duplexes, triplexes, whatever and some houses and they have been battling in court. The different, um, like Wells Fargo and different, the mortgages keep getting sold to the different agencies and mm -hmm. then they take them to court, lying in court. I mean, it's been to the federal level. And they're fighting and fighting and fighting and my sister-in-law is fighting back. She's the, she's the head of it. But it's happening everywhere. They are doing everything they can to take mm -hmm. your property from you. Yep. And we have, to, we have to do better as state government and county and um, city to protect people from that because they're being overrun by the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. I love your idea though, that there needs to be more. I know that there are already, um, um, I said, I said uh, mediation <laughs> advocacy because uh -huh. that's a word that it's like rural king. <laughs> but yes, I, I agree with that. I support it a hundred percent. It's got to be local. Mm -hmm. I'm the kind of person, I'm. my stance is that we have to have churches in the communities and neighborhood 
um, groups supporting each other. Mm -hmm. Less government and more community. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, that's just my thing. So, yes. So one more question that's very broad, and I know everybody in this room asks the same question. Why is it the same people come to here to get more information? It's the same people all the time. How do we educate the public as to what's going on? Because we are so complacent, and that's why all this stuff is going on right now. And I just don't yeah. know, I mean, what are you guys doing to get out there and make the public listen I, and not just educate. I'm personally, educate. I'm personally knocking on doors. That's all I've been doing is knocking on doors. I just, um, wow, we just went to a mailbox location for an event in that area. It's a gated community. Mm -hmm. And I got, there are people who, one big tall, everybody's taller than me, big tall Democrat <laughs> male came up and started asking me, it just being really nasty about Trump and things like that. Mm -hmm. And because um, he saw the America First thing on the back of my t shirt, and he was joined by another Democrat and joined by another Democrat. They were spouting off every CNN headline, mm -hmm. and they were being brutal, and they didn't realize that just because I was smaller than them and a female, that you know, I, I wanted to pummel them to the ground <laughs> on video. But um, I showed great restraint, and I try to end it saying, we're going to have to just agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. And That's my right. thing is, the biggest problem, and I said it was elections, the biggest problem with our country is the device, the division. Mm -hmm. yes. And only we can only heal the division on a local level, and then it will spread. But if we can't find something to agree on and come to the table and work on that, and you know the rest of the stuff will will go but the, you have to get out there and talk to people that was just that was just three out of hundreds of people that I talked to over the past week mm -hmm. at this um, just handing out flyers and my information people are hungry for information they were they were like gobsmacked that a candidate was standing there and talking to them and things like that but you don't have to be a candidate to do that like I said before knock on doors, yeah. call, email, support mm -hmm. candidates. Mm -hmm. Don't count on social media because we're we're all being um, shadow banned mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for you to see the real hit with yours. You still have a good reach. Mine's down to mm -hmm. like three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> three. Because of it, yeah. But there are ways, but it's just getting out there. It's wear, wear a t-shirt that that says something that will maybe not get you stabbed in the back literally, mm -hmm. but that will spark a conversation and just be bold. Have have literature that you can hand out to people when you're waiting in line somewhere. Yeah. But get the word out and then invite people to um, meetings like this. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> this, this is a small group, but yeah. this is an influential yes. group because yeah. the people that are here, mm -hmm. that's what they do. They talk to hundreds of people all yes. the time. Yes. So. Right. That's what we. That's what I've found. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been a network. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. and you, you know, you build that, and you meet somebody, and all of a sudden you're like, oh well, you know, they know, they know a hundred people that that mm -hmm. you just you didn't have a clue mm -hmm. that they had a connection to, and you know, you you spread that word. But uh, I get it all the time. Where, and I'm sure you do too. Where people are like, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I got hugs for yeah. doing yep. this. Yeah. You know, and mm -hmm. and I and I said before, I, years ago, I I was the last person in the world that would think he would wake up and be running for office one day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I never never would have happened. Yeah. Um, and and I had to be kind of pushed to to do it. Mm -hmm. And when I when I made that decision, and I'll be honest, when I was asked, um, it took me a month. <laughs> to say yes because I said look I said this is something I said I would never do but because I'm being asked I I have a difficult time saying no to people I said but because I've been asked one I'll pray about it mm -hmm. two yeah. um, I will I will talk to people that I respect and you know consider their opinions before I can give you a decision but I had to know that God was telling me to do this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I told God 35, going on 40 years ago, 
I'll go through any door you open, mm -hmm. but I'll never bust my way through one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And after 30 days of prayer, he tapped me on the shoulder and reminded me of, of what I committed to and said, see, I've put before you an open door. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I immediately you know, knew that, hey, this is something I have to do. Mm -hmm. And for all of us, it's the same way. There's things that happen, and, you know, you, you sense the urge to do something, mm -hmm. or you sense the urge to say something. The mm -hmm. um, same way as, you know, we're often prompted to, you know, to give somebody a gift, you know, and help a family out or, or something. And, you know, and we don't always act on that. There's many times we're like, eh, that, that's, yeah, that, that's, not, that's not what I'm supposed to do. I'm just, we pass it off and we don't do it. And then we feel horrible for a week. We're like, yeah. oh man, you know, I, I knew I should have done that or I should have said that. Yeah. And I don't ever want to live with that regret. But, yeah. but for me, it's been that constant, you know, you're just constantly before somebody that tells somebody else. And, and, and if you're associated with larger groups, mm -hmm. we'd be happy to come speak to your groups, you know, one-on-one -on -one help you organize, different things like that. Because we have to, like I said, this, we're one election away from losing our country. Find mm -hmm. your place on the battlefield. Right. And other people have to do the same thing. Yeah. I am going to close the formal <laughs> okay. part of this since this I have no formal? other written uh, <laughs> questions. I think it's important Not to really note. Enough. I think it's very important to note that both Becky and Steve live nowhere near here. Yeah. Their district is quite a distance from where we are physically, and yeah. they went out of their way to be here this morning. Yes. And for that, I think they deserve a round of applause. We've got two great yeah. candidates here. Yeah, Fortunately, do. I'm in District 26, so I don't have to make the decision. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, thank you again. You, you're both tremendous. Yeah.